I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Alison Ota, who's the director of the Royal Asiatic Society, who will be visiting shortly. Um, Alison is a historian of Islamic art with a particular interest in Mamluk manuscripts. She's currently involved in a project, of, uh, cat a big project, cataloguing Mamluk Korans in the Egyptian National Library. And the title of Alison's paper is Opening Windows on Asia, the Royal Asiatic Society and the Beginnings of Asian Studies in Britain. Thank you. Right, well, I'll start. Um, the Royal Asiatic Society was founded on the 15th of March, 1823, by Henry Thomas Colebrook um, at the Thatched House Tavern, St. James's Street. And I've got a picture of it. And I put this in because it makes, when I first read it, I thought it sounded like the Royal Asiatic Society came together in the back of a pub with a few notes in the back of an envelope. But this is a picture here of the Thatched House Tavern, which um, was demolished apparently in 1844 and was celebrated for its club meetings, large public rooms and public dinners, especially for, for societies. And it looks quite, quite grand. <laughs> Um, the Royal Asiatic Society then received its Royal Charter the following year from George IV for the investigation of subjects connected with and for the encouragement of science, literature and the arts in relation to Asia. However, for the roots of the society, we have to go back to the Asiatic Society of Bengal, founded in Calcutta in 1784 by Sir William Jones a judge in the East India Company, a talented linguist who had already taught himself Arabic, Persian and Chinese before arriving in In India, where he embarked enthusiastically on the study of Indian law, music, literature and botany, and also produced uh, English translations of several works of Indian literature. The society had been set up by Jones so that those working in India interested in its languages, culture and history, could exchange ideas and publish articles and essays in the journal Asiatic Researchers. He described the scope of its study as man and nature, whatever is performed by one or produced by the other, covering the subjects of geography, history, government, to name but a few. Colebrook, uh, well, I've got another picture of him. <laughs> Colebrook had been president of the Asiatic Society of Bengal and served the East India Company uh, in India for 30 years. Um, finally, as a member of the Supreme Council, returned um, from India in 1815 with a hallowed reputation as a scholar administrator. He is often described as the first great Sanskrit scholar in Europe. As Stanley Lane Poole, um, the um, Orientalist, noticed in his entry on Colebrook in the Dictionary of National Biography, his reading must have been immense since every paper he wrote testifies not merely to his originality and ingenious turn of intellect, but to the breadth and extent of his researches. And I think this is a very important point it may, he makes now. And it must be remembered that all this Oriental reading had to be pursued in manuscript and that there was hardly a printed book to smooth his progress. The essay on the Vedas was among his most important works. So Colebrook actually had to go out, find the manuscripts, then bring them home, and then translate them, and look at them, and then write about them. Um, and there was, because there was nothing else around at that time. On his return to England in 1815, he set about the task, in the words of Ludo and Roseanne Roche, who published um, Colebrook's biography in 2012, uh, 2006, entitled The Making of Western Indology, um, of promoting India and the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Britain and Europe. His interests encompassed a broad spectrum of subjects on which he wrote numerous articles, including Indian astronomy, mathematics, philosophy, Hindu law, literature, and botany. He also published several translations many of which remain the only one to this day. And an example is algebra with arithmetic and mensuration from the Sanskrit of Brahmagupta and Bhaskara, which has been reprinted a number of times, most re recently in 2005. He was an active member of several learned societies, 
including the Geological Society, where he became vice president, the Linnaean Society. He also became a fellow of the Royal Society in 1816 and the Royal Institution of Great Britain in the same year, whose aim was to promote science education to the general public. He was also one of the founding members of the Royal Astronomical Society, serving as president for two terms after Herschel's death in 1823, and also the Zoological Society in 1824, where he was a member of its council. And he was also elected as corresponding member of the Société Asiatique in Paris. So he had numerous links and, um, you know, with people uh, in, in London, with other societies, and of course, overseas. He also played an important role in making his extensive library of manuscripts available to scholars in Britain and Europe. And he finally gave them to the East India Company in 1819, when 22 chests of Sanskrit, Prakrit, and other Indian manuscripts arrived at their library. Franz Bob, who was to become the first professor of Sanskrit in Berlin, traveled to London to consult them staying from March 1819 to July 1820. And he wrote, he was astounded that contrary to the practices of other libraries and individuals who were averse to lending manuscripts, Colebrook was an exception. And he wrote that Colebrook, who of all Orientalists here, matters most to me, not only for his learning, but for his outstanding collection of manuscripts. He had a long friendship and correspondence with A.W. Schegel, the German poet, literary critic and orientalist, and he also corresponded with Nathaniel Wallach, a superintendent of the Calcutta Botanic Garden. So, and this is an example from a letter to, to, from Wallach to Colebrook in the RAS archive. Colebrook was thus an important conduit for relationships between numerous societies and individuals in Britain, Europe, and India. Um, Max Muller said of Colebrook, had he lived in Germany, we should long ago have seen his statue in his native place, his name written in gold on the walls of academies, and we should have heard of Colebrook jubilees and, and Colebrook scholarships. But it didn't really happen here. <laughs> so, but anyway, we the foundation of the Asiatic uh, Society had taken three months of planning, with the first meeting taking place in January 1823 at Colebrook's house. And it has been suggested that this was in part a reaction to the establishment of the Société Asiatique in Paris eight months before this, although Colebrook himself never makes any direct reference to this. But in a review um, of the first transactions of the Royal Asiatic Society, published in the Eclectic Review, a British literary periodical, a literary periodical published in the first half of the 19th century, the article opens with this comment. It does not redound to our credit as a nation that an Asiatic society should have been instituted at Paris before it was thought desirable or feasible to establish such an association in our own metropolis. Now, if we go back to this um, first meeting here, um, those present uh, included Sir George Staunton and Alec uh, Zander Johnson, who are both to go on and play very important roles in the Royal Asiatic Society. And I think it's quite interesting to look at the, some of these people's backgrounds in relation to the foundation. Uh, Staunton, who accompanied his father, this is a picture, at, you'll see it tonight, and Staunton is the little boy, just in the corner there. He was the page to Lord McCartney, and his father's at the, the front there with Lord McCartney standing next to him. So Staunton accompanied his father on the McCartney mission of 1792 to China as a boy of 12 when he, he, when he learned Chinese, and he was the only member of the mission, uh, in fact, to do so. And the story goes that he was able to embark on a dialogue with the Qinlong Emperor in Chinese, who was very impressed, who then gave him a golden purse. Um, later on, he became head of the East India Company's factory at Canton. And if we look at the other individuals, Sir Alexander Johnson, um, he also had a background as from a child in, in, in Asia. Um, he accompanied his father 
uh, to Madras uh, in 1781, and he was later ap appointed Advocate General in Ceylon in 1819. So they come together in, in Colebrook's house and they set up a committee of management um, and Colebrook was appointed as director and Charles Watkins William Wynne was appointed as president and he took this position because he was president of the Board of Commissioners for the Affairs of India and George IV agreed to be patron. So um, Johnson, Staunton and Malcolm then became um, um, vice presidents. So they set it up with a very <laughs> clear uh, form of bylaws and we just changed the bylaws not long ago and it's, it's, everything is set out you know, to a T in these. And I'll just say something on Malcolm because he was another important member of the society. Uh, he had entered the East India Company as a cadet and went on to hold several important po posts, including ambassador to Persia. And I, this is something I just found out as an aside, and I thought it's quite interesting because he's credited with having introduced the potato to Iran. So it's <laughs> a piece of useless information, but interesting. He was also resident of Gwalior and governor of Bombay. So these are the people who are there right at the beginning. Um, at the meeting in the Thatched House Tavern, 80 members were in attendance and they had 300 had applied to join. And actually it wasn't cheap, it was 100 guineas, you know, was your subscription, which is an awful lot of money. Our subscriptions are not like that anymore, I have to say, <laughs> very unfortunately. But. Um, other notable members included Thomas and William Daniel, um, the artists who are known for their published views of India, and they were also responsible um, for the design of the logo, which is still uh, in use today in one of its many incarnations, and the one tends to be the one for the signet, which is in the middle. These were used as library, library stamps, but we don't use them anymore. Um, Colebrook was eager not to tread on the toes of the parent society in Bengal. Um, or the two other societies which um, had been formed in India, the Bombay Society in 1802 with the intention of promoting useful knowledge particularly such as now immediately connected with India and the Literary Society of Madras in 1812 and both became affiliated to the Royal As Asiatic Society and are still uh, in existence today. Colebrook set as the London Society's primary goal the advancement of knowledge in relation to Asia, not just India. And this is, this is how he was able to justify um, the, the Royal Asiatic Society in London in that it focused on a much broader geographical area and not India. His address at the Thatched House Tavern noted that the world at large owed an enormous debt of gratitude to those countries in Asia in which civilization may be justly considered to have had its origin or to have attained its earliest growth. And then he goes on with a rather strange thing to express the offer of assistance which would contribute to the augmented enjoyments of the innumerable people subject to the British sway abroad. So he's very much a man of empire. Britain is going to improve all these beginnings that um, were started in Asia, all these civilizations. Now, at this juncture, you might ask how many Asian members, or indeed Indian members, did the society have at this time? And I think this is an important point, because the earlier societies that I've just mentioned in India did not admit Indian members until quite a bit later. Um, however, the RAS, Royal Asiatic Society, London criterion for membership relied on scholarly contributions and background and work and there was no mention of race or religion. Now the society um, at its foundation of course conferred honorary membership on a vast range of um, the high and mighty, the King of Oud, the Raja of Tanjore, Abbas Mirza of Persia, uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha of Egypt, Fat Ali Shah in Persia and King Mungut Rama in Thailand but these were just honorary positions. They weren't perhaps involved in the, um, in the work that was taking place or the um, communication of, of ideas. 
but the first Indian subscribing member of the RAS was Raj Ram Mohan Roy uh, in 1824, so a year after the found, uh, foundation of the society, the Hindu uh, educational reformer. And of course, he, he, he um, came from a, quite a, a, an aristocratic or you know, um, high background. He traveled to England first in 1831 as the ambassador for the Mughal Emperor Akbar II, and again later in 1833. And he died very sadly in Bristol only 10 days after his arrival uh, of meningitis. But however, he visits the society in London uh, on his visit, and he's welcomed very formally, and he's welcomed to the society as a scholar, and I quote, likely to facilitate the future proceedings of the society and extend the influence of science and literature over the Mohammedan population of Asia. So, you know, he's accepted, you know, as, 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 as an equal, that's what I'm trying to say, whereas in India, it wouldn't have happened with the Indian societies at that time. Avril Powell, in an article for the RAS newsletter, noted that the corresponding committee set up by Alexander Johnson marks the most interesting and active collaboration between the society and Indians in this period. Uh, Johnson asked British members of the society to identify Indian scholars who would be elected as corresponding members with no subscription to pay to pursue inquiries on behalf of the committee. So in fact what they were doing was using this committee in, set in London, communicating with Indian scholars um, in India and asking them to send information back. So um, now the contributions or the communications were of three main kinds. The first were private communications to Johnson and his committee, some of which were read at the society's meetings. Others were published in the journal. Um, the second were articles or translations which were put into the journal or um, were published by the Oriental Translation Fund, and I will talk about that in, in a moment. Um, and uh, uh, books which were generally the members' own works, and several Indian uh, scholars do send their own publications which are then entered into the library and reviewed in the journal. However, the enterprise was quite short-lived and died out in the 1840s after the death of Alexander Johnson. Now, from its beginnings, the society focused on the dissemination uh, of knowledge of Asia through the publication of its journal, books, lectures, and the establishment of a library and a museum. The early issues of the journal faithfully record the donations to the society and stand as testimony to its international standing and also the relationships that they had uh, with other individuals and other institutions throughout the world. For example, the journal report in 1834 records that over 150 donations were received for the library and the museum from institutions and individuals, which included the Imperial Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg and the Medical and Physical Society of Calcutta. These um, donations included an assortment of unexpected objects, which when listed read like snatches of a poem from Edward Lear. 24 Parthian coins, specimens of alligators from the western coast of India, a horsehair guard for the mouth, the pine cone of an edible pine, and so it goes on. Other entries included a ball of ambergris in a gold filigree purse and enclosed in a gold and silver network purse, um, which uh, was given by the Persian prince Abbas Mirza in 1823. And in 1841, a bit later, the Penny magazine published two articles about the museum, and it mentions paintings, sculptures, inscriptions, letters from, again, this Persian prince, Abbas Mirza, who seems to feature prominently, uh, models of Indian implements and machines, musical instruments, fossils, minerals, stuffed crocodiles, the skull of a hippopotamus, um, a double sea coconut, a yard in diameter, and a sheet of paper uh, made from bark fibre measuring 60 by 25 feet. So you can see it's quite a <laughs> different list. However, in 1869, with the move to the more restricted premises in Albemarle Street, nearly all the objects were transferred to the India office from where they were sold or placed in appropriate 
institutions. Meanwhile, the society focused on maintaining its collections of printed books, drawings, paintings, um, and also its substantial collection of manuscripts in Arabic, Persian, Ottoman, Malay, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Javanese, Pali, Tamil, Burmese, Prakrit, and I can go on, Hindi, Gujarati, etc. Um, the 1834 report records the donation of 180 manuscripts, um, which included one of the um, finest illustrated Persian manuscripts of the 15th century, and it's still to this day seen as this. This is um, Shahname, um, the Persian national epic, the Book of Kings, copied between 1440 and 1445 for Muhammad Juki, um, who is the sixth son of the Timurid Shah Rukh. And it was presented by Lieutenant Colonel Doyle um, uh, uh, and bears very interestingly the seals of um, all the Mughal emperors and has an autograph uh, entry note by Shah Jahan noting its entry into his library in 1628. And this is just an example from it. And I, I, I included this because I thought you might wonder with the list that I've just given you of objects that maybe a lot of things are not of any great significance or value. <laughs> with the, but this um, remains to this day a very, very important manuscript. It um, came, went from the Mughal library to the Nawab uh, Vizier of Oud in 1818, and then it was given to Lord Hastings, who was Governor General of India, and then he gave it as a parting gift to Lieutenant Colonel Doyle. So from the start, the society was keen to publish the research of its members and the diverse nature, nature of their investigations. It's represented by the titles of the articles in early volumes of the journal. For example, the 1834 volume includes articles entitled The Oriental Origins of the Gypsies on the Puric Sheep of Ladakh, Memoir on the Diplomatic Relations between the Courts of Delhi and Constantinople in the 16th and 17th centuries, and along with more mundane topics such as meteorological registers recording temperatures at Dum Dum in Bengal for each day of 1822 at sunrise, noon and sunset. So the society was also involved in book publication um, and in 1828 it established this, what I mentioned before, the Oriental Translation Fund which published translations of Oriental texts. The prospectus stated that it existed for translating and publishing such interesting and valuable works on Eastern history, science and belles lettres as are still in manuscript. Now, one of the, these public, and we've got another slide, this is just a few examples here, um, but um, the architecture of the Hindus um, by Ram Raz um, was commissioned and then published by the society in 1834 uh, and it had the, this group of 47 drawings which were prepared for the publication are still in the society and I think this is quite an important uh, text because it is by uh, an Indian and um, we're told in the introduction to the work that Ram Raz was of humble or origins um, he was born in uh, Tanjore in 1790. He learned English while attached to a native regiment until the position of Vakil or, or regimental a agent, and then later was employed as a clerk in the office of the military auditor general. And he comes to the attention of a man called Richard Clark, who was a member of the Royal Asiatic Society. Uh, who was working uh, in the Madras civil service because he translates a code of regulations uh, drawn up uh, on the order of Tipu Sultan from the Maratha to English and um, the, they be, they're extremely impressed with the quality of, of this translation. So um, Richard Clark proposes this project to Ramraz uh, that he undertake uh, this um, publication of this treatise on Hindu architecture. And with this, Ram Raz is elected as a corresponding member to the RAS. And um, here we have an example of one of the drawings. 
Uh, the drawings um, are executed in pen and ink and wash uh, and relate to architectural details found within Hindu architecture, comprising town plans, elements such as pillars, bases, porticos, columns. And this was the first attempt to translate the Vastu Shastra, a vast body of Sanskrit, Sanskrit texts that described with precision how buildings should be planned and constructed. And for his research, uh, which he began in 1825, Ramraz drew on several uh, different Shastras, but mainly the Manasara and the Mayamata, um, whose importance he describes at the beginning of his essay. The texts weren't assembled without difficulties because in a letter to Clark dated 1827, Ramraz outlined some of the pitfalls. And he's obviously sending these as reports to Clark, um, who must have been, in fact, back in Britain at this, at this point. Since my last letter to you, I have collected ample materials for an essay on our architecture. I am now engaged in examining them and hope to be able to send you the result of my examination by next season. Works on the Silpa Sastra are very scarce in this part of the country, and even the few scattered fragments that can be had are scarcely intelligible to our best educated pundits, as they are so full of memorial verses and technical terms that none but those who have been regularly initiated in the study of art can comprehend them fully. Um, some of these drawings can be compared to South Indian temples, this is a, another one, and the um, drawings were made in the European manner um, by various unknown Indian artists working for the survey department in Madras. And by 1831, uh, the drawings were complete. And together with the manuscript and the translation, they were then sent back uh, to, to London for publication. The essay on the architecture of the Hindus discusses whether there is a connection between Indian and classical architecture, a subject which was of great concern to William Jones whose work on the gods of Greece, Italy and India examined the similarities between Sanskrit, Greek and Latin. Ramraz was firm, however, that Indian architecture was a separate tradition that owed nothing to Western influences and he politely rejected any such connections. Sadly, he died shortly after submitting his work in 1830 and did not have the satisfaction of seeing it in its published form, nor the enthusiastic manner in which it was received. At a Royal Academy dinner in 1833, Sir John Soane told the president of the RAS that he was strongly in favour of it uh, as an object of deep interest. Um, today, Ramraz's work is recognised as a, a pioneering work on, on Indian uh, architecture, and people are just actually now beginning to, to look at it and the drawings associated with it. Um, the society still houses collections of drawings and paintings that illustrate really the flowering of British interest in the history, flora, architecture and scenery of, of Asia, people of Asia. And I just thought, just I'll just show you a little bit of each of these early collections because I think they're sort of in, informative on, on how these people came together. This is um, the botanical drawing, botanical drawing from the Jones collection. Um, and um, they're represented by the work of Lady Jones, who was the wife of, of William Jones, um, and um, who, who I mentioned earlier as the founder of the Asiatic Society of Bengal. And this um, is, in fact, paint. The collection contains her paintings, which are not very good, and. <laughs> uh, um, these other ones by in various Indian artists. Um, this is Sheikh Zainaldin. Um, he specialised in botanical drawings and he's also one of the principal artists employed by Lady Impey, wife of the Chief Justice of Bengal, Sir Elijah Impey, for her pictures of plants, birds and animals. Um, another important uh, collection is that of Todd, the Todd Collection. Um, who served uh, in the East India Company in Central and Western India between 1799 and 1822. Um, and on his return to England, he becomes the first libra librarian of the society. 
and he embarks on the writing of his book entitled The Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, which was published in two volumes in 1829 and 1832. And it's still regarded as a very important work if you're looking at the history and genealogies of important Rajasthani families and the history of Rajasthan. Uh, the paintings and drawings in the Todd collection comprise of drawings by his uh, kinsman, uh, Patrick War, of topographic, topographical and landscape views of Rajasthan, and this is what is you, are used in his book. Um, and also, um, we have um, paintings in the traditional Indian style, and these include portraits, historical and mythological scenes, which have been given to Todd as presents, or in fact he commissions court artists in Udaipur to copy these from the royal collection. So he makes copies and he brings these all back to, to, to England. Um, and here we have Maharana uh, Bim Singh and in fact um, this is later copied and then used as the frontispiece uh, for, for his book. Um, um, the Maharana was, had a very good relationship with Todd and this is why he's chosen to fill that. And we have another painting here. We have, there are lots and lots and lots of these. <laughs> the other important collection from this period is that of Brian Horton Hodgson. Um, and this relates to Nepal, um, where he was the East India Company resident in Kathmandu between 1824 and uh, 43. Now again, he pioneered studies on Buddhism, languages, zoology, ornithology, and ethnography of the Himalayas. He contributed more than 170 articles to the journals of the Asiatic uh, Society of Bengal and the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, he employed artists uh, to make drawings of the buildings of the Kathmandu Valley which are the earliest representations of Buddhist architecture in Nepal. Um, he collected Buddhist manuscripts, of which we have several in the collection. And today his collection is divided between the Natural History Museum, the Société Asiatique in, in Paris, the British Library, the Musée Guimet. Originally, parts of his collection were given to the Institut de France, and then they were transferred to Musée Guimet, and, of course, the Royal Asiatic Society. His um, autograph book, um, now in the Society's archive, records his correspondence, and it's really quite considerable, with notable Orientalists such as Bourneuf, um, Sir Joseph uh, Hooker, um, and Humboldt, the Prussian geographer and naturalist, just to name but a few of them. So, I've just got uh, one more picture. Uh, just, it's rather nice. This is from the Hodgson collection. <laughs> And of course, the final important collection of this period is that of Raffles, who I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And of course, um, the founding in Singapore and a large number of Malay and Javanese manuscripts. Um, he died um, in 1826, so he was only a member of the society for a few years, but his um, manuscripts which he had copies made. They're copies of the original manuscripts that he found uh, in uh, Malay and Javanese and then they're taken back. And it's quite interesting that the National Library of uh, uh, Malaysia actually asked us because they don't have the originals anymore for microfilm of the copies. So we, we, we were able to supply them. Um, and I just, we've got two very nice examples here of two, two of the uh, illuminated ones. Um, the RAS was established within the active uh, context of empire, and uh, many were involved, many involved in its foundation were connected in some way with the East India Company. In London, the closest link was with the Oriental Club, founded in the Society's rooms with Wellington as its first pre president in 1824. And again, this focused on former members of the East India Company. The society provided in creative terms the means of disseminating knowledge of Asian cultures, religions, 
and history to its members through its meetings, publications and journals. And since its beginning, it has always met on the second Thursday of, of nine months of the year. So that's, that's written in stone. Um, its, foundla its foundation led to the establishment of many associated societies, some of which are still in existence today. I have already mentioned the Asiatic Society of Bengal and Bombay and the Literary Society of Madras, which today functions principally as a library. And to these we can add, uh, in India, the Baha Research Society and the Mythic Society of Bangalore. And in Asia, there's the Royal Asiatic Society Hong Kong, which is still going strong. Uh, Sri Lanka also, again, uh, doing very well. Uh, China, uh, the North China branch, um, which came to an end in 1958, but I'll say something more about that in a minute. Japan in 1872. Uh, Beijing, 1885, again, that, that was stopped, but that's, uh, I'll say something again about that in a minute. And Malaysia, Korea, and Burma. And of course, Burmese one no longer functions. Each of these society functions uh, in different ways, some providing a social for forum without really any direct serious academic interest, while others are institutions of academic standing, publishing their own journals, with their own libraries, collections, and serving the indigenous communities. Now, one of the questions on the sheet before I came was, you know, talking about survival of these communities. And I think it's an important question, is how has the society managed to survive? Um, we don't get any government funding. We, we, we have to survive on ourselves. And I have to say, its existence at times has been extremely shaky. Uh, necessitating the sale of parts of its manuscript collections. But in recent years, a very strong commitment has been made that it should make itself as economically viable as possible, resulting in the move to our new building some 10 years ago, which allows for renting out of parts and supplementing our income, uh, you know, derived from subscriptions and, and journal sales. It's also interesting uh, to see uh, the revival of the North China branch, which started in 1857, shut down, shut down in 1958, and it's now being reincarnated along very much the same model as 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 in 1857, <coughs> as the RAS Shanghai in 2007, and last year they um, started. Uh, the Royal Asiatic Society Beijing. We don't have anything to do with it. This is purely there. They just use the name and that's it. We don't have, uh, we're not instrumental in this in any way. <coughs> the initiative for the recreation of both these societies has again been taken by outsiders who want to extend, disseminate knowledge of uh, China. And, but I have to say they've attracted a tremendous um, you know, interest and participation by Chinese nationals as well. And um, there is a small problem in that Chinese nationals can't join, but that's really, that's a government. Uh, they're not allowed to join a foreign society. But there are lots of ways around this in that they, you know, they don't have to pay subscriptions and they become honorary members. So they, they're making a very big effort in, in that direction. So today, the Royal Asiatic Society provides an active forum for all those who have a serious interest in Asian studies. And the membership encompasses individuals from a variety of backgrounds and nationalities. Those who have worked uh, or are working in Asia, those who are work, have worked or have worked on Asia. It still publishes a journal of international standing four times a year. Publication is now done with Cambridge University Press. It's available online. Um, we have an active book publishing program, which has been maintained since the beginning of the society. And we have lectures, which we hold twice a month, uh, open to members, open to everybody, members of the public at no charge. Um, and they're also available on podcast. Um, and I think, you know, it's quite interesting that there hasn't really been much change in the original aims that were first uh, posited in, in 1823. 
and I think we remain true to the aims of our founders but hopefully you know um, we present our you know quest for this dissemination of knowledge on Asia in what might be termed as sort of a more modern and dynamic context all right thank you very much Thanks, Alison, for that really interesting paper. Questions? Jane. Thank you, that was delightful. Can I ask, I was thinking about, I know a little about the 18th century craze for chinoiserie and asking me the book over at Kew. Yes. By the time the Royal Asiatic Society was founded, is there still that public interest, and do the public come to lectures, do we know, or...? I, I think um, I, it, it's very difficult to gauge. Mm -hmm. um, I think all the people that they're interacting with, and I mean there are lots of them, most of them have worked overseas or with the East India Company. Um, and there is, is there is that connection. I just, yes, I think you've Q, and of course there was the mosque at Q as well. And uh, um, I, they talk about lots of mem members of the public visiting the museum but I really don't know about uh, the lectures and, and that. I, I would imagine it was probably quite a formal event whereby you read papers and you read letters. If you look at the minutes, they are reading communications from India or from um, you know, various other China or whatever. Um, I can't imagine that members of the public would have, may have wanted to come. But I, I know they do say that it, the museum was very popular. Yeah. So they, they were allowed access in that way. Yeah. Didn't you say that a sort of the geological society had a mixture of specimens and then plaster casts of specimens from around the world? So they had a kind of totalizing view of the universe that they were going to eventually get it all in there. Was that part of the aim of the Asiatic Society Museum as well? Um, I think. Uh, I don't. I, I. I don't know, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think they just. They seem. To, I mean, when you read the lists of an edible pine cone mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, they just took in everything they were given, <laughs> and you know, it was just. They even got a mummy, but they had to throw the mummy out because it went off, because <laughs> <laughs> it got very smelly. Yeah. So there's a whole bit in the minutes about this mummy being very smelly. What are they to do with it? So, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and, and they, they, then they, they're quite happy. I think a lot of it's thrown out. Yeah. I mean, they did have very valuable things as well. One of the great treasures was the Jade Cup of Jahangir, which is now in the V&A, which they sold to the V&A for £100. Pounds. Yeah. So did the V&A sort of try to take over then, effectively? Yes, they it did. The collection? Yes, I mean, it took a lot of, a lot of the stuff. We had to we had to actually get back some of it. So, yeah, there was no room for the society to have a museum, and I think they did the right thing. Actually, they put, put the objects you know, where lots of people could see them, and we focused on the, on the on the manuscripts and the library. John, um, I just got a question about London in this, mm. and I was fascinated by one of your early slides, the name escapes me, but the guy who died of meningitis 10 days oh, after yes, entering yeah, the country yeah. in Bristol. Um, I mean, <laughs> Bristol there, I mean, it's fine because it just, it's not the Royal London Asiatic Society, it's just Royal Asiatic Society, and, and it may be an imperial way just assumes London. But given the fact that people and these objects would be entering through other ports like Bristol, uh, and Liverpool and mm. Glasgow mm. as well as London. I just wonder whether what the network is, whether actually this society at its outset had people, representatives, uh, connections in those port cities of empire at home, not 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 in the empire, it's, uh, you know, in India or Japan or China, but in the UK. I'm sure they did. Yeah, and I just wonder whether, whether he was giving a talk, for example, in Bristol to you know, to a similar society that was affiliated to London. Is there any record of that no, kind of thing? No, there isn't. I don't know what he was doing in Bristol. Um, I know that, I mean, he he's actually still buried there. They moved his body after 10 years, and Princep actually designed 
this too. So I think that's quite, he was obviously held, you know, in great esteem. Um, and they talk about his visit um, to, to the society in London. And he was obviously received very, very warmly and with great delight. I don't know why he went to Bristol. I will see if I can find out. But it, that, univer that statue is in the university. Yeah, so I don't know if he had mm. some, um, yeah. you know, he was going there for some purpose. I mean, he was quite a radical yeah. man, I mean, uh, in, in Hindu yeah. terms. And with his radical reforms, he believed in education for women. And so maybe he was going to the he was going to the university. Would you? Well, it, it's tremendous that the Enlightenment model of uh, meeting together, learned journals, mm. uh, publication collections, libraries, and so on, is so robust that it continues today in one form or another. But the the next big change that's uh, already on us, I suggest is that many of these things can now be done on open access mm -hmm. so that the instead of as it were the um, the white men uh, anthropologizing the, the people in asia uh, the people in asia can also participate because they can read what's being written about it and they can write and it can all be done uh, at no cost mm -hmm. if, if you want to talk further uh, uh, if you want to talk, for, uh, I want to make another point. If you want to talk further about that, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm um, chairman of an open access mm -hmm. academic publishing mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. and we do actually have a proposal on um, on the table at the moment to, to publish the, the works of Sir William Jones. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And um, I think that will go ahead, and that will. He, he's a towering figure mm -hmm. in his life, and um, but the. Uh, well, the the second point I want to make is that although this seems to be uh, a part of an imperial project or a Europeanizing project, that uh, from the beginning, William Jones and others were importing ideas as well as, uh, so there, there is an exchange of ideas coming in, particularly from Bengal, and that the the, the need to translate the, the laws of Bengal, mm. which were in an oral tradition, mm. into uh, printed form, mm. literary form, uh, and they weren't necessarily fully understood. But those were then imported to, to England and, and uh, other Anglo countries and have influenced the common law yes. of, the, of yes. this country. And so it's in, in that way it's anticipating uh, the, the more contemporary world that uh, that we have to do, have today. Yes, no, but, I mean, but, it, but yeah. that would also depend upon um, your bringing the people in. Mm. 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 No, I, I agree. I mean, there's a, a, a Colebrook devotes a huge swathes of things to you know in his articles to Hindu law interpretations of Hindu law. Um, as, as Jones did, and I think Jones, I mean, when you look at him, he's so enthusiastic and he's so fascinated by everything that's happening in India. I mean, he, I think he calls it the new Greece, the new Athens, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And um, um, Colebrook, I, I see as not, is much more analytical, in fact, in his approach to his, his studies and to to his work, but yes, I mean, they, Colebrook followed Jones as as president of, of the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal, and I think Jones was the great mover behind that, it, it, because he was so enthusiastic, because he was so good at, you know, he, his correspondence was tremendous with other people, he was very interested in, in what he was doing. That's what it really got it off the ground, and then you get um, Asiatic Society of Bengal, and then Bombay, because everyone sees these as really good ideas, and then Madras. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question about how the society, about the society's rules, which you said, have in many in many cases endured, because they sound very, very similar in some way to the literary 
Fundraiser, which also re meets nine months a year, it still does on the second Wednesday of every month. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the has, 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 has this same system of, of, of president and then vi or president and vice president of patron again a, a royal figure that I was wondering to whether whether by the time the Royal Asiatic Society is set up in 1823, and what seems to be a period where a whole lot of other societies are set up, the geological and the astronomical, and the zoological, he stated to what extent there is a recipe for a society. I think this there, I think there, probably, yeah. Do you, is, there, is there a sort of a sense that there, when there, is there any record for when they're drawing the rules up of them taking various things from us? Um, they societies? don't say that. Mm. They don't They don't say that we, but mm. you know, they. I think they start, I think it's January the 9th, they start putting it together. Mm and they have a few meetings and by the 15th of March they've done it all. Mm, so it clear. sounds as if they had certainly examples to there work from. And of course they were, I mean you mentioned the Royal Asiatic Society in your talk today mm -hmm. with Toast. So they must, there must have been some reason for that. that yeah, but the Chief, the chief that has, has them all to get to guess it, didn't they? Yes. I mean, the Royal, the Royal History, it's exactly the same time as the Royal Society of Literature, yeah, which is posted exactly. in the Chief in 1822 before it's formally set up. So it's obviously there are, uh, I was interested also in the point you made about how the crossover that Colbrook had, he's in six other societies, oh, that's the case and not yes. the other. So there is a sort of administrative class here who run a whole yes. lot of these societies. And we were talking yeah. about that this morning, mm -hmm. I mean, do you want to... Well, that's the bust of the recipe. One of the things you must have for the start of the society is a bust of your founder. <laughs> yeah. um, we were talking this morning because Francis Chantry, who's appeared, yeah. his bust has appeared twice today, was a member of the Geological Society, the Linnaean Society, the Royal Society, the Royal Astronomical Society, the Zoological Society. <laughs> and when you make a Venn diagram of all the sitters of Chantry, you're basically making a diagram of the of the club membership around here. So there's a bust of Colebrook, there's a, bust there's a statue of John Malcolm. I mean, you were yeah. just reeling off one after another of Chantry sitters, and we've seen a few more today as well, so another part of that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it occurs to me this possibly looks forward to, tom to tomorrow and sort of ancient projects thing, but it would be good, quite good in some ways to create some to create this sort of Venn diagram and, and, and the committees and see, right, and see, see, that see across oh, yeah, the yeah, 300 yeah. committee yeah. places in London. <laughs> they're occupied by a total of 100 <laughs> people or something. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> what they, they, they did Monday, Tuesday, and yeah. see what other dates they had. The, mm. the things is, of course, there's the Royal Geographical Society. Mm. 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 Even graduates from the Royal Institution, for yeah. societies, but even from the newer upstart lecturing organisations, yeah. you can be moving up on top. So I mean, that's one of the things we talked about at the last workshop, wasn't it? About ways of representing through maps the intersections or the concentric circles of influence. Uh, which are often multiple and shared yeah, yeah, within yeah, yeah. within London or within other cities or within dissenting communities or whatever. So actually finding a way visually of representing mm -hmm. that. So you can press, I mean, the, the idea, that, well, one of the examples, not a very fortunate one that I came up with was, uh, you know, when you when you press on the Ryanair website, you know, in, in your <laughs> fit of horror, you know, but uh, when you look at destinations and you, you, you click on one hub, and things light up, and then you click on another hub. What would be good if you you had multiple clicks, and you could see where the patterns overlap? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that kind of thing, finding the kind of a spatial yeah. visual representation of where people are and who they're in contact with across different societies is something that we, we speculated about last time, which we I think we, I think you're absolutely right. We should come back to tomorrow. John Mee is building something like yeah, John Mee was at the last yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But yeah the and there's, there's the Francis yeah. Bacon kind of uh, project which also has a website of that kind as well. And there's a new mapping sculpture project as yeah. well which is yeah. also trying to find out what the connections were between stuff and give you the details, particularly the headlines, yeah. find ways of searching across the world. I think those kind of things can actually produce mm. new knowledge as can't they? Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden yeah. they can bring things together that people mm. haven't known mm. actually. Mm. Yeah. Do you have a question, Greg? I hope it's a question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean you, you mentioned before about the way in which it's sort of we seen as a kind of imperial idea, um, the East, you know, based on the sort of East India Company and, it, and its sort of its, its jurisdiction. But I, w I suppose I was wondering about it as a kind of romantic creation in a way, because in Bilton it must be a notion of kind of comparative culture, historiography, mythography. It seems very much of its period. You know, it doesn't seem to me to be by accident that Soane liked it because he was very much into 
seeing everything as part of this kind of syncretic mm. world mm. system where everything had a place and everything might have evolved. And, you know, he obviously didn't want to see Indian architecture as having evolved from the crypt, uh, the sort of from, from European, but he would have been very happy to see a connection, you know, sort mm. of labyrinth mm. as it might be. Um, it seems to me amazing and wonderful that it should have survived the emergence of sort of national societies um, since the Victorian period. Um, in India, you mean? Well, yeah, when Indian societies and yeah. Chinese societies and the Middle East. So I suppose I was asking how much is it a kind of romantic society that's interested in kind of comparative <laughs> work uh, in a way? And how, and how has it managed to survive the emergence, presumably, of, of competitors? Well, I mean, um, in I mean, in India, all the, uh, the um, Royal Asiatic Society in Bombay and the Asiatic Society of Bengal are still there, and they they have their own libraries. Um, the one in Mumbai is probably more successful um, because it's more open. Um, Calcutta is extremely difficult to get into. Uh, they don't reply to emails, um, but they have a wonderful library. They have a wonderful um, art collection, which is moving away. But and it's in the hands, I suppose, of let's say an elite group of academics, <laughs> Indian academics, who are not going to um, perhaps open up, um, open up, open the doors very easily. But Mumbai is much more dynamic. Uh, Sri Lanka again is uh, uh, operates very well. I mean, it's we receive the president and members of council from each of those societies if they'd like to when they come to London to visit. Um, I see. I, I think they see these. They're very proud of these societies. They love to come to the society in London, um, and they see them as embedded in their own you know, history and culture, you know, they are national institutions now, they're not. The, of course, some of the buildings have that aura of empire about them, but I think the, the actual feeling is that, it, that it's, you know, it, it's eroded sufficiently, it's not identified in that way. And they have, you know, they William Jones is held with great respect, and Pearlbrook, and, you know, all, all these founders there. Okay, perhaps we could, uh, I'd like to finish at five, if, if possible, so perhaps we could um, finish <coughs> this discussion and then have, a, have a, a few minutes of summing up and then head over for a second. Oh, sorry, did you want to cover it? Are you sure? Yeah, it was a comment, not a question. <laughs> Feel free to make it then. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's just that I've recently been reading documents from the romantic period of the uh, Royal Asiatic Society and um, it remained all the way through the 19th century very much a romantic period institution, which was really interesting to me. So hardcore romantics who were born a little too late for the period could still romanticize <laughs> within its boundaries. And one of the interesting things that I discovered was that whereas the meetings where, where members actually came remained rigorously academic and you, you if you were going to publish something, you read it out loud to the society before it got published in the journal. But um, the Oriental Translation Fund was keen not only to period to publish hardcore scholarly texts, but um, to, to try to use that as a popularizing medium because they really mm. wanted to mm. to encourage to, back to Jane's question, they really mm. wanted to encourage popular interest in these mm. other cultures and the figure I work with um, he actually puts in one of his introductions to a translation, which is really peculiar since he's addressing a more general reader for this translation. He's excoriating the British public for not wanting to learn these Asiatic languages. And so he has to translate it because they, they just refuse to learn Arabic and Persian and read it. The original word is <laughs> so much better. And he's really ranting and raving while he's translating this collection of tales that's very much like the uh, Thousand and One Nights. Um, it's the same kind of structure, and so obviously he's trying to choose a popular text. But one of the things I ran across was a was a, a curry cookbook 
that they that they translated. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously trying to oh, cater yes. to this popular yes, that's true. interest. But I mean, mo most most of them were quite, I think, quite serious things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is sort yeah. of a yeah, traditional no, no. thing. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, yes, that's true. And, and it was very, I mean, you know, the Oriental Translation Fund covered, um, you know, The Man in the Panther's Skin, which is a Georgian epic, you know, it's not really Asia. Our, our definition of Asia is, is very fluid. Fluid, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thanks very much, and thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you.